Hi, and welcome to an exciting episode of Mehfil, where as the old tradition goes, we gather across borders, and in this case, time zones. My name is Amrita Ghosh. I'm an academic, and I like to think and write about South Asian literature and film. Our episode today is called Wounded States on Writing Conflict. And I have two prolific writers with me to talk about the heavy, that urgent topic of war. We will discuss the challenges of writing about conflict and violence, its representation in literature, and how to negotiate aesthetics and literariness in politically charged topics. I have with me two brilliant writers from the wounded spaces in India's borderlands. Mirza Vahid is from Kashmir, and Aranika Ship is from Assam in the northeast of India. Both are award-winning writers who do the important work of transforming difficult histories into moving prose. They are widely acclaimed and are read and loved across borders. I've had the privilege also of teaching both their works in my classes, and I'm so keen to dive deeper into this conversation. Welcome to the studio, Wahid and Aruni. Thank you, Amrita. Thank you, Amrita. I like how both Wahid and I started mildly grinning when you said, I teach your works. <laughs> I, I just actually had a course uh, where I taught both your works. That is um, right. We love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> teach it again. <laughs> I absolutely will. Um, so Wahid, you're from Kashmir, the highest militarized zone in the world presently. And Aruni, you also come from a conflict space in Northeast India, and both of you have lived through the ongoing conflicts. What was your imperative when you decided you're going to write about these conflicts? Um, both of your works underscore voices and stories that often get erased or silenced. Was that a reason? Um, I don't know why don't you start? Oh, okay. Well, you know, there are too many reasons, actually. One of the reasons is just that I was very compelled to, to write about these things. Um, the insurgency started in 1979, and before it, a lot of other things were happening that basically were a result of long-term discrimination and apathy by the state and state violence, state constantly meddling with the affairs of Assam, and as a result of which there was a lot of political instability. You know, as we say, the impermanent state. But obviously that blew up into a huge major insurgency, and a, uh, and a big movement in 1979, but the insurgency has still continued, even though it is not as intense and violent as ever. Uh, so my family was affected. My my life was all about, you know, uh, making my way through security posts. Um, we My father had to carry his identity card wherever he had to go. Uh, we were stopped um, when we traveled as a family. Um, and uh, people were getting killed when I was growing up, and which was extrajudicial killings that came to be known as the secret killings of Assam, very much like the dirty war in Argentina. So things like that were very much part of our lives. and uh, But at the same time, they also came to our breakfast tables in the form of newspaper headlines. And I remember asking, what does it really mean? What does what does Dharkhan mean? Which means rape, actually. But a lot of these were committed by the security forces while committing uh, conducting counterinsurgency operations. And my parents would be dumbfounded with those questions because they didn't know how to explain that to me. And that was the case with many others uh, uh, of, of my generation. So I think um, it was so formative, so I had to write about it. Um, but actually, I'm a very different kind of writer. I grew up reading a lot of thrillers, and I always wanted to write thrillers. But when I was in Delhi, I realized that I had a very different kind of childhood. I moved to Delhi to study literature, and I realized that rest of my rest of my classmates who are from not not from Kashmir, not from Assam or Nagaland, they had a completely different kind of childhood. Their headlines were not like. So many people were gunned down during a skirmish, but their headlines with the cost of onion was really expensive, you know? And I thought that they had no idea about what was going on. Uh, and of course, this was a result of the Indian state's disinformation campaign and uh, a very deliberate, very constructed, very orchestrated disinformation campaign. My father worked in the All the Radio, so I was privy to most of those conversations, how what a news would be represented because I was living on the All Indian Radio campus, the station director, the news editor, the producer, everybody was family friends. Family and, friends. I, and I grew up how they were trying to follow government guidelines in order to actually present the news, you know? And, mm -hmm. and that was just one tip of the iceberg. So 
I, if I wanted to write a thriller, I couldn't write because I was so compelled to tell this story in order to just see that not we all thought the same way, that we all didn't agree with it. And more importantly, I also felt that my generation had absolutely no idea who studied in English medium schools. I had a very different kind of childhood. I'm happy to, I'm happy to kind of elaborate on that. I went to an English medium school, but many of them were middle class and upper middle class people. I was a poor kid, you know, and if you have watched the, uh, uh, these, these, these typical Netflix uh, television shows where there's, where people are put together. So in a, in an, in an elite school. So I was like, not, I was a middle class person. Everybody was really richer than me in my school. So they didn't have any idea. They went to holidays in London, you know, they went to buy shoes in Thailand. So things like that, a lot of them actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I thought that I really had to write something that, that, that would sort of record this, you know, now I'm seeing all of these things, but I was more driven by instinct because I wrote my first novel, which Wahid very generously blurbed. Uh, uh, no, I read it. I read it. I read it. I read it. And I was kind of, I was like, yes. it was a you know, moment of, uh, what do I say, mutual encouragement that you have a writer from a similar literary context. And I'm sure Aruni must have been writing a draft mm -hmm. somewhere mm -hmm. when I was writing my first novel or something. So those are good comments. No, sorry, I'll carry on, Aruni. No, no, no. And uh, those are the reasons. And I was um, encouraged by Wahid, who's, whose work I admired. He's just finished, uh, published, actually, the collaborator at the point of time. And uh, I had heard about him because the collaborator was named, I think, the Valley of Yellow Flowers before it actually was published, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and, yeah, and I heard it from the grapevine that this is a great novel coming from Kashmir. And I thought, oh, somebody writing about similar issues. So Wahid, I, over to you, actually, you know. No, yeah. no, 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 no. No, that was fascinating. I, you see, as Arun is right, I don't think it's kind of this one impulse that I must write to address a certain absence or erasure. I think um, the impulse is that I have a story, you know. Now, obviously, because we come from these places, you know, as Aruni mentioned earlier, we come from these places, the so-called conflict zones and conflict areas and troubled areas, uh, like Palestine, for instance, Palestine. Mm -hmm. um, so naturally, the kind of stories we have or we grow up with will have a lot to do with what has happened to that place or what's been done to that place. All the things that Aruni mentioned, you know, the, the killings and the mass rapes and the collective punishment that's kind of, you know, inflicted on our peoples and has been you know, uh, inflicted on our people. That is part of your entire literary learning as well, along with your traditional modes of learning, which is you read your books, you have your mm -hmm. favorite texts, you have your favorite poets. Um, as, as, as you know, I studied English literature, so did Aruni. So even when you're doing that, that kind of, or uh, the, the, the or literary publishing or the literary culture, therefore mm -hmm. I'm going to write a book to mm -hmm. fix that. I think the primary impulse is I have a story, mm -hmm. you know? And then naturally I will choose my, I will obviously I make choices that my story is going to deal with. It's not going to deal with uh, songs on the Shikara. It, mm -hmm. not to it will deal with the hardness. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then, as I think as somebody mentioned once, you know, along with the dehumanizing that happens because of war and because of violence, there is another kind of dehumanizing that happens, which is the dehumanizing of that. If that is that these people do not have other stories. This is all there is. So it's kind of a double kind of blow to to people growing up or people who live in those cultures, that one, you have the horrors of the war. Then you have the dehumanizing effect of, okay, this is now what they will talk about. And this is what now we must talk about, you know, Absolutely. as if, as if they don't love. Yes. You know, as if all these people don't have sex or they don't have children or they're not petty, cruel, stupid human beings like the rest of the world or, or cruel for that matter. Mm -hmm. So all those things do not cease to exist just because we have this. And so so what I'm going to say is that all these things go into these stories. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking back, you know, because as, as Aruni said, I wrote a collaborator a long time ago now. And I think, yes, it was the good, it was the right sort of thing to do in that this is the only story I wanted to write at the time about mm -hmm. what had happened, you know. But that's not where we want to stop or that's not uh, you know, that's not all. Right, right. Yeah, I, uh, and, and, and I'm so glad 
about when you said that people are consumers of life, sex, food, uh, cruelty. That's why I have a five page long sex scene in my in my novel. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. And, and but then I don't I think there comes a point where you don't struggle against this because there will be mm -hmm. categorizations. Aruni will yeah. be called this writer from Assam, right? Yeah. And I will be called, yeah. oh, this is a writer from Kashmir, and so and so is from Palestine. So uh, therefore we go to these people for uh an anthropological lesson on on or cultural or political lesson on Kashmir or Assam or you know these things. And Initially, you become slightly frustrated or agitated, or you think, no, 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 no. There's more to ask. We can actually we do read a little bit, and we, <laughs> and, and we, we can write uh, nice things. We can write things, but then I think there comes a point when you don't really care because you have your job to do. You want to write. Mm -hmm. you want to, you I, I want to join yeah. because this was a follow up. I wanted to ask both of you. Um, you know, there is often this problem, and Vahid, you literally talked about it, this creating an arc of the author, categorizing you as the author from Kashmir or Aruni, the author from Assam. And I've even heard this, another category of resistance literature. How do you both react to the term that would you categorize your writing as resistance writing? Or would you not even care about the categorizations that happen to your own works? I think I might care about it if I sense or smell that it's being used as a restrictive label, you know, if it's uh, deployed to, to, you know, f box me in, hmm. you know, then I'll say no, you know, that's, you know, I don't mind the phrase as such, but many times, and Aruni probably has faced mm -hmm. this as well, it is sometimes deployed to kind of box you in that this is what this guy is about. This is yes. what this woman is going to write about. Um, so then I, you know, I, I don't think I describe myself as a resistance writer. You know, I, 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 I think the most comfortable label is the writer. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I'd like to just pitch in by saying that, you know, um, I, I actually, I'm an, I'm an academics, you know, and, and, and Amrita, you know, like I, I'm, we both talk about post-colonial theory whenever we get a chance. So I'm very much an academic, you know, my, one of my, you know, way of looking at the world is true literary theory as well, even though that's not what I predominantly use to understand the world. So I think that these are all, I feel very flattered actually when people actually find these ways of looking and talking about my work, it doesn't really offend me at all. I also feel that I really talk enough about my work in order to shape the discourse around it. So I have always given a yes to interviews to the smallest magazines, to the, to the national mm -hmm. newspapers. Because one of the mm -hmm. reasons I wanted to do that because I think writers who are from the mainstream, so-called, they don't, they have the privilege of not being misunderstood. And I always, always participated. I, I would go to rural colleges and talk about my work and, and, and participate in the discourse making of it. In some ways, even engineering that because, because I want to make sure that people heard me. And I think I need to do that because, you know, there are not a lot of writers writing in the Anglophone uh, or the English scene from Assam and writing about the themes that I write about, you know. So I think that, you know, it's all of these uh, ways of looking at the work as conflict literature, as resistant literature, as artist writer, as um, queer writer, all of these things, you know, I'm happy to be called any of that because I think I'm, I'm, we are multitudes. I'm a brother, sister, husband, mm -hmm. brother, father, mother, everything. And so it's the same way, you know, um, there are different ways of looking at, there are instance, many instances where I know a lot of young scholars who are writing scholarship about my novels and I read sometimes their work and I'm very fascinated because I never thought about that but it's a very interesting way of looking at it and I'm very grateful that they are using all these wonderful lenses you know uh, uh, from different different uh, discourse traditions mm -hmm. to analyze yeah. my work and I just, but, I just but, come on, we do like to be called a novelist once in a while not <laughs> yes <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah absolutely that's who I am yeah I'm just, just a novelist who writes books you know. <laughs> But, yes, you know, absolutely. my next question would be on because we're we're entering the zone about literary criticism, about discourse mm -hmm. making, and I just read um, Vahid your uh, fantastic essay in Lit Hub where you do talk about various other kinds of reading that you do and what that means. Um, so, you know, as a literary critic, and you know, here I'm writing and thinking about your works. I often get the criticism, which is problematic in the first place 
place and perplexing given the kind of literature we are discussing. And I'm sure you both have heard it too, um, but there's this accusation that literature is being so political, that it's literariness and aesthetic form. Um, they are being overshadowed by politics. How do you both respond or negotiate such critiques that literary form has been forgotten? Sorry, I didn't, is, are you, uh, it, do you face criticism for? Constantly, yes. Accurate work about? Yes, about the writing, um, about literature has mm -hmm. take, been taken over. For example, as you know, I'm writing on Kashmir presently, mm -hmm. and I'm mm -hmm. always kind of having one side of the debate going on that, oh, this is too politically charged. What happened to literature and that it's, its forms and its aesthetics, they're kind of overshadowed now with historical criticism. That this is not quite, quite narrow and quite narrow and you know, I, no, please forgive me, and shallow way of looking at things because as it's, as it suggests that those two things can't coexist, one, mm. you yes. know, as if it's, it's uh, one or the other. Yes. You know, that's one. The other thing is, you know, many years ago, somebody talked about Achilles, you know, and said, you know, this guy is full of violence, right? Mm. You know, and bloody, you know, you know, likes killing right? and his own power. Yeah. And everyone loves him. You know, and it probably one of the most well known characters in, in the Western canon. You know, and no one says, oh, this is violent or political or, or you know. <laughs> 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 None of those things. And we all read the epics, right? We love them, you know? And it's full of politics. There is politics. It is completely political, you know? Sorry, yeah. it's a very flippant answer. I don't know, you want to come in and let's deal this with, with more seriousness. Yeah, I do think that, you know, there's a lot of this co conversation about uh, looking at literary forms, especially from underrepresented zones. Uh, through various anthropological and sociological lenses. And I'm, and I'm really bored of that actually, because uh, uh, first of all, and then also this anthropological and sociological curiosities towards our work, what happens is that it really kind of takes away the art out of it, that we are good storytellers is not a concern about. And most of the time, many of these critiques and may, not, not by critique, I don't necessarily mean, I mean critique. Uh, by critique mm. actually becomes about what is the author thinking? But you know, I was uh, reading Difficult Women by Roxane Gay a few days ago because I had to teach North Country the short story for my class. And I remember that she has an essay there, uh, sorry, an interview there with, with, um, with, uh, with another uh, editor actually, who, and it was initially published in Electric Literature. And I found that what I was, I always said that. She said that, you know, this fiction is not really about the author. Fiction is about the uh, character that the author is writing. But I think this kind of a discourse is repeatedly kind of, uh, brings back the author and their personal stuff and, and tries to invade literature in a way and expect mm -hmm. things from literature. It's like expecting to eat apples from a mango tree. You know? <laughs> I'm a novelist, right? I don't need, you know, has, wears many hats as a poet uh, and a teacher. And so I will, let's say, talk about the, the, the form of the novel, you know? And I think it's the most mutable literary form, right? It's completely forever mutable. You can do anything mm -hmm. with this. Form, right now, the assumption that a novel can be political or apolitical, you know, is is just not even a starting point because a novel can be so many things at the same time. You know, uh, let me go back to what I do. For instance, so my first two novels are set in Kashmir, you know, mm. and they are political novels, right? Absolutely. And what do I do? What else do I do? I write essays from time to time. You know, so if I was asked, look, am I, am I a political writer? Yes, I'm a political writer. And because I believe almost all of writing is political, you know. And then uh, is, that where I, is that where I stop? No, I don't stop there because I want to write everything. I want to write about between everything that's between the messy and the marvelous, you know between the beautiful and the damn. But I do want to say that I'm a very avowedly political writer and I'm very proud of the label because I do, because all the people I admired growing up in Assam from Indira Goswami to, um, to Yesed Arjit Thangsi to, to my own parents who are, who are writers, they are very, very uh, clear about the, about the social purpose of literature. They were not interested in belletristic work, which is art 
this is just for the sake of being beautiful, you know, and pun and 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 form. Um, but they were very much interested in actually uh, the social purpose of literature, and I and I think people are scared of of the social purpose of literature. I, I, and I, I I'll be honest, I think I'm slightly bored of the binary now. By now, I know? agree. Yes. That that not not with this discussion with yeah yeah, yeah. With, this, with, <laughs> with, the, with the criticism yeah. of you know that oh this is political and you know you're taking yes. away literary yes, uh, yes. or, or, yeah. or no. you're going away from a certain aesthetic consideration of literature and so on and so forth. It is quite yeah. tedious, really. You know, because, yes, but I but uh, why I think it is emerges because they we, we don't get to shape the discourse. The predominance people who shape the discourse want to identify and present themselves as apolitical and say that this is the kind of work we do. I just write for myself. I just write for my own friends and we are apolitical. But the fact is that enduring literature has always been political. I was talking about mm -hmm. Grapes of Wrath a few days ago, which actually led to the change in labor laws in the United States. I was mm -hmm. talking about that another, the, the 1905 or 1906 uh, meatpacking, the, 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 the meat food safety, safety rules mm -hmm. in the United mm -hmm. States was because a, a whole conversation that start, was started by a novel, you know. Even in Assam, the peace process was started by a novelist. And one of the biggest things that Indira Goswami did while starting the peace process was actually edit a collection of poems by Megan Kachari, who was uh, who was actually called also Elias, his Elias is Mithinga Doimari, who was the Alpha uh, United Nations Liberation Front of Assam member who was in jail. Mm -hmm. She went to jail, met him, collected his poems, got them translated, mm -hmm. published them mm -hmm. with an introduction in the Frankfurt Book Fair. And everybody was talking about, oh, if these militants are such a terrible people, but they are also able to write poetry. So it kind of like changed and dented the conversation totally. So I think that essentially literature is very political in nature, and is. especially Art enduring literature. The, ca the categories, yeah. the, you know, the worry about categories yeah. is for other people. When when you are sitting yeah. down to write, you're mm -hmm. not, see, but it's like this, you don't, yeah. sit, 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 you don't sit down and say, today I'm going to write a very political novel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, tomorrow I'm going to write a certain poem which would have a, uh, this uh, s a social message. You write because the, all these things form you. I mean, I, uh, and I don't, I, going back to your point, I don't think you want to, the question doesn't arise for people like, if I can talk about you and us, whether mm. uh, we are political or not. Absolutely. Yeah. It's know, a default thing. Given where you, given, you know, your influences, given the yes. entire sort of, you know, um, package. Right. Yes, it's a default thing for people who are from underrepresented backgrounds, contested backgrounds, who are not in the so-called, you know, the mainstream. But mm -hmm. the mainstream wants to actually create these binaries and and create these discussions and dismiss literature uh, that is uh, subversive in nature by calling it it is too political. It is not literary enough. This is one of the criticism I get repeatedly when I submit my work to actually American mm -hmm. literary journals. And mm -hmm. in fact, people who say that, oh, your work is too political. We cannot represent. Do you, you cannot you, publish. Where, do you, where, where does this come from? Is this a certain uh, territory that comes? This criticism comes from, or does it? Is it? Do you get more of it in the U.S. or 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 in South Asia or in India? I get more of it in the U.S. and there's actually a whole whole big history behind it. One, I'm I'm going to be very short if you want me to talk about it. Is because CIA actually depoliticized and fooled American writers for a very long time during the Cold War. Just to give you the, give you an example, Robert Penn Warren's Pulitzer was influenced by CIA funding and CIA influence. Kenyan Review, Paris Review, these are magazines which focus on the fetishization of beautiful writing craft. Where all funded by CIA and the that's sentence, the reason the why sentence, actually the sentence, such, sentence. yes sentence level belletristic writing take it out take out identity take out race take out social issues take out take out anything that is subversive that and that is why this whole criticism of two political actually exists in American literature and and there are several books about it Eric Bennett's book is there uh, there's another book called Finks uh, how the CIA fooled uh, tricked American literature many many mm -hmm. books in academia have been written about it um, there's a huge archive that is open for research right now. People can go and read it. Read it. it is, I'm not, I, none of these things are original. It's just that they are not very mainstream. So mm -hmm. whenever an, a literary agent or an editor tells me your work is too political, I laugh because you are actually perpetrating the violence that the CIA actually made you believe by mm -hmm. going to these predominantly mm -hmm. white institutions that, that taught all of this, you know, like belletristic writing and reduced politics 
you know, and, and reduce the social purpose of work. On the other hand, the foundation of American literature was always so political, actually, mm -hmm. always so global, but it is so much flattened right now. So I'm thinking that, you know, we are all coming to a space where we understand the binaries and the divide itself is problematic and even false to, you know, um, to even talk very, very limited, but I, but yeah. in, you know, when you sit down, as I, I keep going back to that phrase, when you sit down to write, if there are these pressures or these categorizations or these definitions which weigh on your mind, then you're not doing your job, right? You know, right? Yeah, uh, they have to. You have to leave those things outside the room, or pre preferably mm -hmm. outside the house, outside the neighborhood, outside. You know, <laughs> Seriously. Because well, the next, question, next question really is coming out and as an extension of what we have been discussing. And Bahid, your novels and Aruni, your poetry and novels um, have a focus on the ongoing violence in both the spaces, um, Kashmir and Northeast. And I'm thinking specifically of your novel collaborator, Bahid, which remains one of my favorites. And it has detailed moments of recording violence. Aruni, your stories on your latest poetry collection, There is No Good Time for Bad News, also the graphic scenes of violence um, in it. What are then the limits of representing violence? What would be going too far or not going too far? Um, where do we draw the lines as you write? Um, yeah, no, no lines, no lines, really, no lines drawn because, because um, you know, the lines, if any, are determined by the story, are, are determined mm -hmm. by the work you do, you know, by also the by the form of 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 of, of your work, you mm -hmm. know. I don't think we, um, I don't recall really kind of uh, sitting down and charting. Okay. Um, this is the amount of violence I'm going to put in, 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 in the book or in a certain or in a particular scene. Um, I understand the question, of course. I know what you mean, mm -hmm. you know, but I think it's the form. It's the story. If it belongs in the world of that story, mm -hmm. uh, it will be there. You know, I don't think I'll draw a line if it belongs in that world of story. Now, because we are writing about a world which is full of violence. Exactly. You know, mm -hmm. it will find its way in. Now, the question I think is also what f in what form will it be there? Mm -hmm. yeah. Am I indirect? Is it off the page? You know, is it entirely off the stage? Or do I suggest right. violence? Those are for me as a writer, as a novelist, interesting, fascinating sort of challenges. Because then, then you begin to you know do your work, which is of you know, the writerly work, which is okay, okay. What do how do I show this? You know, do I drop in little bits here and there? Do I have an explosive scene? You know, do I spread it around? Do I care about the reader's sensibilities and so on and so forth? You know, but I don't I don't write those questions and then address those. I am mm -hmm. writing the story. You know, mm -hmm. yes, those things. Yeah, I, in the day you you do, but those are fascinating challenges. I think I don't I don't mm -hmm. really. I don't know about you, Aruni. What, what do you think? Yeah, I I would like to continue what you said. It's really dependent on the project, and I think that violence is violent. Uh, and and I'm not, and I want to be very very clear here. I'm not responsible for how the reader's emotional response to the book is going to be, which seems mm -hmm. to dominate many of our conversations in today's. But it, but it's it's a book, you know. It's going to it's about the real world. It's going to be unsafe and safe and make you feel happy and sad. To the extent mm -hmm. that this con conversation about uh, about the, the reader's emotion towards the book has been fetishized nowadays, that I have students who come and tell me. I'll take your course if there is no one in your in the in the novel dies in your in, in the in the book books you're teaching. So I'll come back to the whole question about the violence thing. I think it's dependent on a project. Um, for example, a lot of the violence in my first novel, House of the Thousand Stories, happened off stage, but in the first draft, it did not happen off stage. I did go ahead and describe a lot of those. But at a point of time, for me, it was really important for me to celebrate the resilience and the perennial consistent resilience of the people, but at the mm. same time show the shocks of the violence. So I wanted to give it at the background. And I can't I, 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 I remember you know. I remember you know. It, yes. was, it was the way you did it was effective because I remember Pablo's kind of you know um wasn't it Pablo? Yes. No? Pablo, yes. yes, yes. 
Yeah, yes. yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm so. No, no. I, I you see. But I, I remember it because, as I said, you, 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 you know, you did it, and you show yeah. a lot of uh, via him. Yes, yes. And the balance was happening off stage, but you know, I think, and I felt that when I was took it off, and I realized that to talk about the a body part found while you went to fetch water from the stream is so much more shocking and actually so much more impactful and lingering than actually just give the shock of someone getting killed like an action movie at the point of i thought that some of the things in the poetry collection are pretty graphic but at the same time i had by this time i had read a lot of like police reports on 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 state violence you know police reports on on ins insurgents killing people and kind of the violence they were they were committing so i wanted to include that because i thought mm -hmm. well it makes mm -hmm. me disturbed i'm very disturbed but at the same but but these people actually went through it if i don't really put it on the page nobody will ever know that somebody went through it and i can trade my own disturbing and my own uh, psychologically repulsive response to it for the sake of archiving and for the sake of representing it for mm -hmm. the sake of mm -hmm. keeping it for for another 10 years in the public memory that's why i put those in because at that point so i think coming i agreeing with wahid every project determines how the violence but i think violence is violent and um, uh, and and it should be violent you know otherwise it is not going to be violence you know yeah you know my first novel the debut is the, a lot of it is set in a field mm -hmm. full of corpses i was exactly. just yes. so how many corpses am i going to keep off screen exactly yeah. yeah so there came a point where i have the narrator the boy uh yeah. Go into a conversation with the cops, you know. And Constantly. to me, at the time, it was a literary response. It was my mm -hmm. way of this is how I'll deal with it, you know. Mm -hmm. That he's going to start talking to one of these guys, you know, and they have a you know decent yeah. enough yeah, conversation. Absolutely. So yeah, that's how we deal with it. I don't yeah. think we draw lines. I don't think I don't. I don't think we should draw lines. I think, as as Arun is saying, no. you know, he in his poetry he makes a point that I'm going to show this part. Mm. Right. And I do remember those uh, parts in the novel, The Collaborator. The, I felt those were the most haunting and poignant um, parts where, you know, we are talking about the galish grins of the skeletons looking mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. um, but we're still continuing with this conversation on how to write about war and representing um, the spaces that you both inhabit. Um, but he representing Kashmir is an extremely charged act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We know that when it comes to representing Kashmir, mm -hmm. it is a saturated space where we have Bollywood, we have international coverage, and you mentioned previously so-called conflict zone, who creates this. Um, and also within India, which has a certain fixed narrative and representation that plays out. How hard is it for you to navigate all these discourses on Kashmir, specifically in your writing about your homeland? I mean, don't get me started, really. You know, you know on, the, on this. <laughs> yeah, Mita wants you to get started. <laughs> no, because there was a time when you felt, you know, uh, I, I, sometimes I talk about this in terms of conversation with conversations with your friends. Let's say, mm -hmm. you know, let's have a category. So there was a time when you felt the need that, that I must explain to my friends. Oh, this is not how it happens. You know, no, 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 no. no. You, you really see yourself, you know, raising your hand. No, no, that's not how, that's not how it happens in in Assam or you know in, in Manipur or in Kashmir, and you say uh, no, 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 no. What you saw on TV, you know, whatever variety, NDTV or BJP TV or you know whatever kind mm -hmm. of TV, that's not what Sarkari. we're about. And let me also let Sarkari me TV <laughs> or Sarkari TV. Let me tell you, <laughs> what, what, and then and you do it. I'll be mm -hmm. honest, and you do it. You 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 sit down. You say you know, okay, let me let me school you. You know, you don't say that because you don't want to be condescending and patronizing because you know how it feels to be condescended to and patronized. So, but you you say, okay, I must now educate and re-educate people. But then you get tired. <laughs> you know, how long am I going to do this? You know, <laughs> and especially given, as you said earlier, in your in your, as you said that you know. The, the, the kind of narratives that are kind of, you know, manufactured, put together daily, right. you know. So 
And then you think, okay, no, I'm not going to do it. You know, I, I, it's not my job to teach you. I will do my books, of course. Mm-hmm. I will write my books and my poems and my stories. Um, because, um, you know, when, since, when did it become my job to want, write my books, you know, do my teaching, <laughs> you know, <laughs> deal with my, with the, with the, with the, with the, with the publishing world. You know, right. and then also to tell my liberal friend in Delhi that what you understood about Kashmir is completely <laughs> wrong, is hideously wrong, you know, and, you know, you do it. As I said, to an extent, you do it, you know, mm-hmm. but then a lot of it is, uh, and especially now, you see, there, I think this question was more valid, let's say, I would say, I don't know how many years ago, some years ago, it was it had more validity in that, uh, not your question, the, the, the question that confronts us, you know, right. because mm-hmm. there was because there was pos- there were possibilities mm. of doing good work, you know. You had you you know uh, let's say Aruni's novel would have started the conversation at a certain campus, and then their people are talking about it. They are holding a seminar. They are talking about it because it's a decent world. People are talking about books, you know. Right now they say we don't want Aruni to come within one thousand miles of let's say that campus <laughs> because he is anti-national, for instance. Mm-hmm. You know, right. so so we, you know, so th- these these kind of so-called boundaries have changed, and they've changed in ways which I we kind of knew it's going to happen, but not uh, nobody knew it's going to be that bad. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. now now we are now at a point where people are celebrating a patriotic nationalist film as 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 the savior of Indian democracy and and secularism, and I was you know, just. So- Say that you know. But, yes. but I don't. I don't see. But I see. I see it with empathy, with with understanding that this is how far. This is how bad it is that mm-hmm. we have now. You know, uh, outsourced the revolution to Shah Rukh Khan. <laughs> it's true, though. It is completely yeah. true. Yeah. Symptomatic. Yeah. And, and he's you know he's he, he's a superstar. He's brilliant and all those things. But he's not going to make anything which will remotely resemble. Challenging the system. Exactly. Yes. And um, why should he? Yeah. I think it's not his task. I think why should he have to? Yeah. And yet he's yeah. co-opted in very complex ways. And you know, I want to turn the same okay. question. No, no, I think I'll, 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 yeah, I'll let Aruni do his. Uh, and yeah. No. Back, I, I, Aruni, have a... I want to ask you the same question. Yes. Um, about Northeast, there are some horrible stereotypes and toxic ways in which. Uh, dominant India refers to people from the Northeast, and you were talking about certain things before about discrimination too. How do you cope with the burden to representing and correcting some of this in your own work? The short answer is I really reject the burden. I don't feel burdened at all. Uh, but uh, I think we all start at a point when I was in college, so just like just like Wahid, I wanted to correct the the, pe- the stereotypes. I wanted to write, and I wrote a lot of these kind of short stories. And thank God nobody published them. And I hope I have destroyed all those floppy disks. And I hope there is no computer in the world that can read floppy disks. But I do think mm-hmm. that if if and I and, and the second second response is I have a very tongue in cheek standard response. Uh, Priyanka Chopra should be doing all of this, represents Assam. Mm-hmm. I don't represent Assam. She got 15 crore rupees to represent Assam, and she should be doing this. I've said this many times. So she's the one, you know, who is but you know, rep- responsible for representing Assam or the next person who the Assam government hires in order to represent Assam. I don't represent Assam. I represent what I think and what I believe. And I happen to be from Assam or from Northeast. Um, and I don't ride with those burdens uh, because uh, I think it is a, it is a, it is a kind of a, you know, representation in politics is a cliff eventually, right? Mm-hmm. Eventually, everybody will fall <laughs> off that cliff because somebody always will come and say, oh, this book doesn't represent X, Y, Z, theme or people or person or tribe. Mm-hmm. So when you are actually trying to represent something, you are going actually walking towards a cliff. It's just like it's, it's a matter of time until your turn comes, you know. So that's one thing. Um, but um, uh, what I think is that... Um, what I think is that I do feel uh, that that we do write to a certain kind of vacuum and, and that impulse, as we talked in the earlier question, kind of drives mm-hmm. us. Uh, I'm really lucky that, that I have a readership and I'm able to do that, but I do not feel the pressure, uh, pressure to represent anything. I do think mm-hmm. that, you know, uh, 
Uh, I've grown up reading literary fiction. I'm a literary sc uh, scholar. I'm a, I'm a teacher of uh, creative writing. I even inadvertently uh, end up uh, verging towards things that needs more voice, needs more uh, uh, visibility, and 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 I write towards that vacuum. But that is not the you know primary goal. It, I can't do that because that that representational burden is really really immense and and again as i said it's it's a really it's a, it's a yeah it's a mirage you can't keep on doing yeah, here's, that. here's what i here's what i here's what i have to tell the, my work story. over the years with regard to oh. my work over the years with regard to kashmir being a kashmir writer kashmir writer in london uh, representing kashmir whether we like it or not and so on and mm -hmm. so forth mm -hmm. i uh, it's taken me years to probably come to this understanding it is i expect the i understand the expectation right you know, I understand the expectation. I understand the expectation from broadly two perspectives. I understand the expectation from people. You know, and and it's a kind of natural expectation. Mm. You know, from the people in in Kashmir and Assam that they will see this person. He's kind of you know, oh, he's talking. He writes books, and this is what he does. So he's going to talk about it. So I understand the expectation. Uh, with regard to then the other broad category is the corrective is that you see something out there which is as i said hideously wrong and you know it's hideously wrong and then do you feel the need you know to to issue a correction sometimes you do sometimes you do because it sometimes it goes to the very core of your being you know it goes to the very heart of your whatever is there to you whatever is close to you whatever means to you um so in that uh, and then I go, going to, to kind of, you know, echo Aruni's point of view. It doesn't, then it's not a burden. Right. That's, you know, there is no, because you, it doesn't matter how, then how is it, how it is seen, you know, mm -hmm. in so and so quarter. You think mm -hmm. I want to do this. Mm -hmm. you know? I'm not doing it because, you know, you want me to do this. Right. You know? You know, I feel I must issue a correction because I think I believe I know better. Right. You know? I do want to so speak the, about this. Uh, so it's, yeah, a, it's, a, it's a kind of it's a complex complex kind of you know yeah. terrain. Yes. Uh, but going back to what I earlier said, but I do not want to spend my life teaching those people who have spent entire lives uh, in in the so-called mainstream at the center where they have this vantage of telling someone from Assam or Kashmir yes. how they must feel. Yes. So that, mm -hmm. I, that I reject because that is just too crude a, a, a category mm -hmm. to kind of cater to or to address. Yeah. You know. Um, I, I want to identify that first thing that, that some, of, some of the earliest impulses and continuing impulses in, 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 in writers from and the representative literary tradition is to actually represent those things that have that have not been represented so so we are already starting with that goal in mind in some ways but i think that yeah but i think that it cannot be the primary goal you know like i uh, again how can i not talk about tony morrison my favorite writer uh, she said mm -hmm. once that the function of racism is actually to keep us distracted that somebody would say such and such people have large heads and then you spend 20 years discussing actually we don't have large heads you know mm -hmm. something like that i'm paraphrasing her beautiful beautiful you know, I, 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 yeah. remember, I remember reading this yeah 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 so I think, basically you know, you're, you're you're kept away from your work i think what uh, exactly, what, what exactly. person's whole sort of thesis is the about fact, all these things absolutely. keep you from your work and yet in the, the work that you're become, doing you are yeah. the corrective representation by yes. writing exactly yeah, we are. the fact that we are writing the fact that it's, we are writing about underrepresented themes, the fact that we are coming from spaces that have been erased, is a representational act and a radical act itself. Absolutely. What, so to put a more burden and say that you have to do X, Y, Z in order to have a cohesive picture is like curating a Netflix show. You know, that's not what we are doing here. You know, and we are writing so that more people from our region can come and write. We are writing. I am I am teaching and writing and teaching and 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 mentoring people so that more people who write and worry about similar kind of things can write. And I I keep on saying, you know, I don't. Uh, I wish there was a bigger community of Anglophone as uh, as Chinese writers here in the U.S. because now this is my new adopted home right now. And I mm -hmm. and I consciously try to create that actually 
and I think that they will come and tell the rest of the stories. So that I, that's why I, that's how I feel that uh, I don't have the representation burden. And I think that this whole representational burden is is a is a mirage. And I just joke about it. But again, the fact is true. It is true that we the fact that we write is very representational yeah, and seeking yeah, to avoid itself. Yeah, you know. Just, uh, yeah, and but we <laughs> And also, right, no, no, yeah. you're right. But also, but again, it is. This is. It is again one of those things. It comes from other people. True. Right. May, yes. This is how I think yeah. about my work. Yeah. You know, exactly. You have ten, fifteen. Let's say, if you stretch it, you know, twenty years of work. Mm. Left. Yeah. We would hope in more. Which work, right? In which I want to write the stories I want to write. You know. Mm -hmm. And those are stories that I have lived with, uh, or have it been in my head, or have come up with recently, all my life, right? Or the stories you wanted to, you've been thinking about since your childhood. Mm -hmm. Now that's what you want to do in those years you have left. You know? And as Arun, you said, those stories will do the job, you know, by their very existence. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and and I think representation is not necessarily always about in a book because the book is determined by stories and structure and editing and all of that. Am I, my, I, I'm very invested in representation and uh, impulse and politics. And I do that by supporting BIPOC writers. I do that by supporting queer writers. I do that by supporting Assamese writers, Naga writers, whenever I can. Uh, and, and trying to get those right uh, by trying to actually encourage a lot of my students of post-colonial literature to work on their, their thesis uh, by pushing a lot of my friends to, uh, and editors say, hey, listen, such and such writers from Nagaland, their book is out, why don't you do a review, you know? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I, mean I, I don't have to uh, keep on, you know, go on showing that, that I do it, but there's a lot of background work that goes on, which is like yeah. tilling the earth for the next next gen. Match of people yeah. become match of the generation. So I'm not that old yet. I think it's to do with, you know, the thing is you do have a platform, you know, when you, yeah. when you exactly. uh, publish. And so then th with that comes a certain, um, a, you know, the, the, the area of ethics and responsibility and all those things come into play, you know, yes. because you have mm -hmm. a platform and you have made a platform, of course. Mm -hmm. So then I think the question is, what you said is, is a question of language, which I will address this way, which I'll answer this way. So a few years ago, somebody wanted to ask, somebody wanted to have a debate about, um, whether Kashmir can be described, categorized as an occupation or not. You know, so discuss and debate and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now I have a certain platform, so I am so and so person, I have written books and so on and so forth. So I will address it simply by not indulging in the debate, by saying Kashmir is an occupation. You know? So be because I chose a certain language, I chose certain right. words. Right. You know? so th th those are things that I you know do take seriously. You know, very, very seriously, you know, but in because, the go on, Vahid. Yeah, because I know somebody young is as Arun is listening. I know somebody out there, a person who's just, you know, in the university or the college or is starting out as a writer or a reader. It doesn't have to be, everyone doesn't have to be writers. If they, they, they are kind of, they pay attention to your words. I right. don't think lots of people pay attention to our words because not many people read books now, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But those who do, then, then the, the the question of the, your language, you know, what is uh, what is it that you do with your words? That that is important, and I take that very mm -hmm. very seriously. I, I find this conversation really important and um, rich because you know we're talking here about representation, but you're also talking about you know the writers that are published. Um, you're talking about the platform that you both have. Um, and I think we're also veering into the question of publishing itself um, mm -hmm. because, you know, there needs to be the space for the publication of these writers. And, you know, I'm curious about if you both ever have struggled to find publishers and an audience with the kinds of themes and topics um, and the fiction you write in India or internationally. And I know that, Aruni, you talked about you being in the U.S. sort of categorized as being too political. So... Has that kind of struggle happened to both of you? You want me to go after my publishers? And also the audience. <laughs> you're publish, but why your publishers are publishing you? So they are they are doing the right thing. <laughs> yeah. 
I okay. Let me add, put it this way. Um, so many years ago, um, yes, I Talk was about that one who rejected you. <laughs> So I no, let me put, I, I have a story. I have a story. I, yeah, please. So many many years ago, my debut novel was gonna, you know, a, a, a major US publisher was interested. You know, as they are that okay, they want to publish my book. So obviously you're happy. You're a debut writer. You know, you kind of you know you worked hard and you you know, you think yes 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 please. <laughs> you know, and they were very keen. And then one day they 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 called me. And this is many, many years ago. They called me. I was traveling, but I said yes. Of course, I'll take their call. You know, <laughs> and they, and I and they and they were very nice. You know, and they said we like your book. We want to do this. We want to publish it here and everything. But we're wondering if you could do a couple of pages of historical background uh, towards the beginning of the novel, as a part of the novel. Yeah, yeah. Mm. As in, yeah, yeah. And wow. and I said no. And I'm, you know, th- as a result, the the my debut was never published in the US. My goodness! You know, I outed this story today, but of course I haven't taken any names, so I'm fine. Yes, <laughs> you are. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I. This is an illustration, but it was very nicely done. Actually, they were she, the person who you know kind of wanted this book. I don't think it was kind of there. Uh, decision. I don't think they, that's how they want it because they were a literary editor and they knew that you know this is a book. It's done. You know, it's it's this is how it's done. I think they must have been asked because I think the phrase being must that must have come into play is for the U.S. reader. Mm. You know, because of course publishers, some yeah. some some marketing suit, some salesperson just is, is decided that the U.S. reader is completely ignorant and doesn't know anything. So mm-hmm. therefore, we must ask the writer to have a couple of pages of historical background by way of expo- explaining the context of this book. And of course, I said no. You know, right. um, uh, but those things kind of you know are part of the industry. I have kind of you know begun to understand this is we are part of it, right? Mm. And yeah, you know, they. So I wish it was better. I wish you know celebrity yeah. memoirs weren't paid lots of money. I wish celebrities didn't write as many memoirs. I wish TV <laughs> uh, famous TV people didn't write children's books you know, because do the work. celebrities really write their memoirs? That's another question. Or, another or, or get you know, get somebody <laughs> to write them and you know, get and then split question. and split. Of course they don't. Or split the yeah. Yeah. So we wish all those things didn't happen. And but then this is the industry. These guys they have to. They have to. They have to make money. They have to pay people to work. Uh, all so it's quite complex. But yeah, sometimes publishing can yeah. be hard. Mm-hmm. You know, um, mm-hmm. um, my third novel. Well, this- yeah, took a while to get to. to took a quite a while. I mean, uh, of, of course, I COVID also. Yeah. Yeah. But it's in but the it's US now. Yeah, it's yeah, it's out out now in the US. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's, it's wonderful. Um, at this point. Uh, the Priyanka Chopra is the most famous Indian writer, actually, followed by Karan Johar, because they've been written two books. You do, just, let, you let, like, us, let us sit with you. Like her. I think uh, you like Priyanka Chopra. I like her very much. You know, I think she's <laughs> she's Priyanka Chopra. You know, I watch yeah. every episode of Quantico, by the way. Anyway, so uh, I I will talk about my poetry collection. Mm-hmm. You know, which was the first book I published in the U.S. after moving here, uh, and and um, poetry itself is hard to hard to kind of publish. But all of these, most of these poems were actually published in U.S. journals. The manuscript was shortlisted for two prizes, um, judged by very famous poets. And yet, I had I got at least 140 rejections, because well, and because it was just to, I don't know why. Basically, they kept on rejecting and rejecting and rejecting. Wow. And uh, and 140. I, 140. Yes. Yeah. Unbelievable. I was very persistent. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. And 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 um, forty three to be precise, actually, it's because I sat down and I printed all the rejections one day, and I wanted to count it, uh, and <laughs> and then then that's how it well happened. Well done, finally, for, for, for pers- 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 absolutely. Yeah, it's a lesson I think I think right eventually. Yeah, but you know, eventually it was a very important and emotional uh, uh, decision for me because. I would say two publishers wanted, and eventually I chose one. Yeah. Eventually, but I thought that if I give up, I'm blocking yeah. the way for another collection of this nature, which will talk about uh, state violence in another country. You know, I really needed to mm-hmm. keep going on so that it becomes somebody else can say, "Listen, mm-hmm. this book did well," 
and the, the whatever it did, you know, I, and I do think as a poetry collection, it got quite a bit of attention uh, in its own way, you know, as an independent mm -hmm. small press collection. I'm very happy with how it has been received. People have written about it extensively. I was interviewed and etc. People can Google that. But I think now people can say, oh, this collection did decently fine. So my poetry collection has a space, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. because why it could write, I could say that, oh, I also write House of the Thousand Stories, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth, because a lot of uh, wonderful, strong, uh, black, brown, indigenous writers have written here, then I can come in and say, hey, listen, my work is also sitting in the tradition. But that's a really, I think US for various reasons I already mentioned bef before and earlier in this podcast, you know, uh, mm -hmm. is a very strange literary marketplace. It is a really important marketplace for Anglophone writers because mm -hmm. it's a really big one. It give, you can get a lot of attention. You mm -hmm. care about the issues you write. You, get, you can get a readership. So all of these reasons mm -hmm. I think is important. And as someone who has adopted U.S. as a new as my new homeland, I think we need to work towards making it a richer, more diverse uh, literary culture. And I think mm -hmm. getting rejection, being persistent, is part of that. Mm -hmm. But again, many a times, many of my short stories I uh, have been reject. Uh, people would say that it is very political. Uh, in fact, um, um, someone someone once said, uh, if you can. Put the politics aside and keep it in the background and make it like a love story. I will, I might publish it. Things like that, you know. So, so and 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 the have you, and, and you, even did you, did you consider? Did you consider it at any point? Did you consider kind of old, you know? You know when, when know. people say I'm, they want to. Yeah, you know, because the so jam enters your head, head, right? The seed, the seed enters your head. Okay, <laughs> what if? Oh, what if I? Yeah, the yeah. story was. You know, because we're writers, right? Yeah. Because there's, there's, you know, we, yeah. we have self doubt, and I'm, you know, I'm forever kind of, you know, um, yeah, yeah. I have um, doubts about. You know, I mean, um, I just, yeah, I mean, I, I thought that I actually thought I was still writing a love story. <laughs> it's just that they didn't see. It. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a love story, story. you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is a love story in Assam because this is what happened. This is a love story in 2014 Delhi because Modi has come mm -hmm. to power, so there will be some bit of this, those unrest. I mean, I, when I was in India working there, I was constantly I was giving canceling classes to go to protest marches because the students will come. So please mark us present. We need to go to protest march in 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 Delhi. You know, I was in Sonipat, mm -hmm. and we went. My many of my colleagues, ourselves, we went to those protest marches. Some of the protest mm -hmm. marches or demonstrations were organized on the university campus. So how do you how do you avoid that? And if you include the basic daily life of living in 20, post 2014 Modi, is seen as oh my god, this is too political. I think that's again because Indian English literature is so dominated by a certain kind of writing and certain kind of writers who really have not address these these kind of uh, India that because they have not experienced it I don't blame them at I was I was going to and say that's I was very write, strange uh, yeah I was going to say I will consider I should consider writing a love story uh, you know featuring Modi you know, <laughs> That's what maybe he's incapable of love. Maybe he's incapable of this kind of. The, I, I think a fake person like Modi might be incapable of love. You know, it will be a star-crossed love story. It will right? be interesting. Yeah. It will be interesting. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, so all of these. I think. I think. It, I think this is the struggle that every underrepresented writer actually faces. And then when they are right, they're badly reviewed, you know, mm. uh, and, but you know, you just have to keep pushing on. It doesn't make me bitter actually, because mm. I think it does make me bitter because again, I know so much more than those editors and agents because I know book history. This is what has happened to every black writer. This is what has happened to every indigenous writer. This is what has happened to, mm. you know, mm. every Latinx writer. And, and, you know, there's a, there's a different scene right now, but I know what, how Buddhist I was reviewed. I know how love medicine was uh, accepted, you know, when it first came out and what are the kind of difficulties. So reading those stories really is inspiring to me, you know, and I think it keeps me going and being a, being an academic, gives me a much more holistic and a long picture of, mm. of, of what has really happened in the literary space in this world. And many exciting things have happened and yes. many bad things have happened. And I think, I think, I think the publishing culture rewards someone who is just persistent and, and, I think that, that <laughs> and a, doesn't really give up. Inspiring, inspiring yeah. story. I, mean, I really ins yeah. inspired it that, you know, you, you stuck to it and. And there was a win finally. Thank you. So let's not even get into the problematic of you know what the reviews are later. That's a whole another conversation. Yeah. But as we come to the end of this episode, um, 
I'm thinking about in both your specific contexts, you, um, Bahid, have left Kashmir, and Arun, you have left Assam, and both are writing from diasporic spaces. Um, does it change anything in your works with that distance and also the conflict time? I'm thinking you, both of you kind of gave responses to about what happens to this sort of con con conflicted time. So does time and distance have an effect in specific ways to write? Um, I can I can start. Um, I think I think um, um, it helps me in the sense that pursue a writing life, which I don't think I would have. To, I mean, I I think I would have been able to pursue a writing life, but at the same time, I get a much more intellectual freedom being here mm -hmm. because in India the politicians are in our classrooms at this point, metaphorically speaking. Uh, mm -hmm. They are telling mm -hmm. us what to teach, what not to teach, what can we, and so on and so forth. At least that's not the, it is, politicians want to be in the classrooms in the US, Florida, Georgia, critical race mm -hmm. theory, we all know that, but we are not letting them in. But in India, mm -hmm. the population is so much more pliant, the politicians are, are in their, uh, want to be in the classroom, hello, let's, them, let's just get them in because you're going to lose our jobs, you know, that's the impulse. There is resistance, and, and, and I really admire everybody who is resisting that, and, and I have resisted that, I have been there, I've seen my friends resist that, but eventually, um, you know, you go where you get a job. You know, I did not come here because I'm a refugee or something. You know, I came here because I, got, I needed a job and I got this job. You know, that's why. And I like it here and I see that I can pursue my art. So I feel that that freedom enables me to think about a sum from a distance. And the distance is very, very important to me right now, intellectually important. The distance gives me so much more objectivity and so much more actually uh, a critical eye because. I'm very defensive of Assam and I'm very critical of Assam at the same time. Mm -hmm. And being distant in Delhi used to make me able to do that. Now being in Georgia and being in another country is making me do that even more and make me do my work actually at so much more peace, especially when I know that most of my academic friends are not at peace. They are constantly being bullied. Uh, there is a lot of surveillance culture in the current regime and they are scared about what to teach and what not to teach. Mm -hmm. People are being recorded in their classroom. You cannot even talk about feminism and so on and so forth. So I think it's really important for a diaspora and like us and to speak up, to actually talk and so on and so forth, you know? Okay. So, yeah. and, and we need people. That's why in Assam, in Kashmir, in Delhi, in Bangalore, Kanyakumari, in Georgia, in London, in Florida. et cetera. In Florida, <laughs> Sweden, uh, Connecticut, you know? So we need people everywhere so that, so that we all register wherever we can in our own context that we did not agree to this mayhem. We did not, we don't speak in the same voice, even though it seems like that India is, uh, is speaking in a majority Hindu majority and voice right now, but we must register it through our works, through our teaching, through our syllabi, through our students mentorship that we don't speak in the same voice. We disagree to this and we, we don't want this. Fahid? I'm going to try and keep it short. I'm beginning to sound like a talkative, you know, uncle who says I have two uh, uh, answers to that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, Arun is absolutely right. There is freedom. The question is of freedom. You know, that that's the key key word. The operative word is freedom. I I have I I don't think I would be able to write what I write if I was in Kashmir. You know, impossible. Mm -hmm. They have mm -hmm. made life hell for journalists, writers, thinkers. People are put in prison for Facebook posts. Absolutely. Also. That to, you know, for for having written a report, people mm -hmm. are denied passports, are mm -hmm. are stopped from traveling because of an essay they wrote five years ago in an academic journal. And I'm not. This is not. Th this is the things that have happened for real. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad I'm here. But as Aruni mentioned earlier, I came here because I came here to work for the BBC, and and I stayed. And now I have children here. This is where I live, and I like it. I happen to also like this town. London is a great city, despite Brexit, despite you know all the mess we have in the political mm -hmm. atmosphere and theater here. So I have that freedom. And wh why do I want to emphasize on freedom? Because what do I do? I want to write stories and uh, and. I have to have complete freedom to kind of write the stories I want to write because fundamentally for me the novel form, the story form is is is, is I think I like to think of it as a hypothesis. The, the, the novel is a big what if, you know, and I have to have complete freedom to imagine what if. What if you know this person murders his mother? 
what if uh, you know that boy love likes his father but doesn't love him what if a young boy is uh, you know uh, you know asked to count corpses and pick things off Mm. you know so i want to have complete freedom to imagine that and that i don't think i'm going to be able to kind of you know do that in that's that's one two i think what i will do you know when you mentioned you were away of late i have seen a longing for the language of my child mm -hmm. you know so that's why it becomes complex as well the language of childhood is the language of senses mm -hmm. for instance i often think of this story which i haven't written is Let's say it's an evening, and I see kites flying, you know, in in the sky. And it's an evening just around my neighborhood, in the courtyard, in the large courtyard outside my houses. Not many houses were built yet. And one of the other houses in the distance, they used to burn a lot of fresh wood, mm. you know, which mm. meant in the evenings there would be massive plumes of blue smoke. in that part of the sky in the evening and we'd be in this uh, opposite this house and suddenly there was some in some distance people other boys bigger boys they'd fly these kites because a certain kind of wind allowed this and it was kind of you know i remember this magical completely because there's a smoke there's sunlight somewhere and there's these you know kites going up in the sky and it's an evening okay. but that is that's an evening i have recorded in kashmiri I do not think of that evening in 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 many in my other languages in English or Urdu or Hindi. That's you know, fascinating. That evening I have always sensed in Kashmiri. So mm -hmm. I've noticed that. I think it's to do with getting older, probably, or you know, or just being yeah, being sentimental. I want to thank you both for this absolutely beautiful episode and rich conversation in this uh, mehfil. Thank you both very very much. Thank you for having us, Amrita. And nice to meet Thank you, you. Arunia, after such a long time. Yes, I absolutely. know, I know. I'm so and happy you, to you meet you both. We haven't met in ages. We haven't met in ages. Yes, you know. yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We should we should change that. I hope it changes very soon. Yeah. And really. I, I really like the fact that we're ending the episode with this haunting literariness, which is a case in point in how we talk about war cannot be without the literariness. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.